This video follows on from another video called What is a Price Earnings Ratio? I'm going to take that knowledge for granted, so if you haven't seen that earlier video, do please take a look at it. Here, I don't want to trash the PE ratio. It's a very useful guide to whether shares are cheap or expensive. It's quoted everywhere, newspapers, brokers, other investors, and so on. But I do want to point out one or two pitfalls with relying solely on the PE ratio. It can be, if you like, oversold. So with no more ado, those five problems are going to be what I call the earnings problem, the accounting problem, the lack of information problem, the relevance problem, and the interpretation problem. So, what are those five problems with PE ratios? Well, first of all, a very fast reminder, covered it earlier in another video, on what a PE ratio actually is. It compares the current share price to one year's earnings per share as a multiple. So, very simple numbers. If the current share price was 100p or a pound, earnings per share was, let's say, 10p, 100 over 10 is 10 times. And there it is, your basic P multiple. So far, so simple. OK, what is the earnings problem? It's this. Which earnings figure do you use? You're looking for an earnings per share figure. So that's one year's earnings typically divided by the number of shares in issue. But which earnings figure? And there are potentially three you could use. Historic PE ratios look backwards and take the last 12 months earnings figure compared to the current share price. Forward PE multiples, now these are quite common. We'll typically look one year ahead and try and forecast earnings on the basis that buying shares is all about looking to the future, what a company might be worth and be able to generate, not the past. And then there are people who say, well, those two only look at one year's data, whether historic or future. So actually what you need to do to take into account an entire business cycle is to average 10 years worth of earnings to come up with an average figure, plug that in, and you get something that's sometimes referred to as the CAPE, the cyclically adjusted PE ratio, or the Schiller PE, after the uh, professor who, who came up with it. All right. Now, you can argue the toss, and I'm not going to do it too much here. You can write a degree course on the merits of the three different measures. This one is very common but you will come across the other two. So there's my first point. When you look at the PE ratio, at least establish how it's been calculated before you rely too heavily on it. All right, problem number two, accounting. Now, a price earnings ratio, as we've just seen, uses earnings per share. And the earnings figure there is the one quite a long way down a profit and loss account. In other words, it's the earnings figure for a company after lots of things have been deducted. All right, things like the tax bill for a year, things like interest expense on debt, and a couple of quite subjective accounting numbers known as depreciation and amortization. So my point here is watch out for accounting slights of hand, if you want to call it that way, or call it that, depreciation and amortization being the two prime ones. Now, this isn't an accounting video. You'll be relieved to know, I suspect. But the point is, the earnings figure you're using as a guide to is the company cheap or expensive includes, or is stated after, a couple of quite dodgy numbers in a sense. These are the directors sitting down, working out how long their long-term assets will last, and charging a proportion of those values against profits to reflect the wearing out and consumption of the asset. It's all quite subjective. If that sounds a bit subjective, you know, do you pick 10 years, 20 years, or five years? It is. So just bear in mind that the earnings figure that goes into the price to earnings ratio isn't perfect. And that's the reason why some analysts prefer numbers that I'll cover in other videos, such as earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization, known as EBITDA. All right, but more about that in a future video. So problem number two, can you trust the earnings figure? Problem number three, lack of information. For example, if I tell you two firms, A, and B have a P ratio respectively of five and 10, now just making up very, very simple numbers here, how much information does that actually communicate, that one number? And the answer is not very much. I mean, what does that tell you about the size of A and B? Nothing, all right? For all you know, you're thinking, oh, A is cheap, lower P ratio. A might be a minnow, might have a market capitalization of you know, 10 million, 
whereas B has got a market cap of 500 million. All right? So you just can't tell. So being a single number, P ratios give you a limited amount of data to make a comparison on. And here's another one. Even if they're of similar size, so let's assume that's not a problem, because you already know that, financing structure. All right? When we look at low PEs, for example, you know, you've got to think about, is that low PE a function of risk? All right, is there something about company A, for example, that has pulled down its PE ratio? Could it be that there's more debt financing in one of these firms than the other? And debt does change the risk profile of a company. And the thing is, you just can't tell looking straight at a PE ratio. So the amount of information you can draw from that one number is a bit limited. Bear that in mind. Now, next problem, relevance. A firm may simply not be earnings driven, all right? What I mean by that is in certain sectors, other metrics are more, are more relevant. Now, first of all, some firms don't earn anything. I mean, if a firm's loss making, calculating a P ratio is almost impossible. So it has a meaningless result, all right? But even assuming it's profit making, is profits the main driver of the business? In a lot of sectors it will be, but in the investment trust sector or the property investment sector, maybe assets are a more relevant driver. Okay, in some sectors maybe sales is a relevant driver. So sometimes you need other ratios, price to book or price to sales, which we'll cover in future videos. You can't just plaster the PE ratio across every sector and expect it to give you a meaningful comparison. And finally, interpretation, all right? Be a little bit careful. The multiple expansion trap, finished with a rather grand phrase there. What is that? It's this idea. Supposing a PE ratio goes from 10 to 20. Keep the numbers very simple here. You've got to ask the question, what's happening? <clears throat> Why is that? Why is the PE ratio increasing? Is it because analysts are seeing actual real earnings coming through and are marking up those real earnings? Remember that the price earnings ratio is the share price, that's set by supply and demand compared to one year's earnings. So is an increase in the P ratio based on real earnings growth or is it expectations? Is it the market getting a little bit ahead of itself? Is it analysts saying, oh, we'll mark up the share price because we expect future earnings growth? In other words, the market's getting over exuberant, a little bit irrational and marking up the shares on the back of no real evidence of a proper earnings increase. That's called multiple expansion. You can also get multiple contraction, of course, the reverse. But it's important to ask the question, what's moving the P-E ratio? Expectation or actual results? Now, there are five reasons why you need to be a little bit wary of the P-E ratio. I've gone through five quite chunky topics at speed there, and I've assumed you've watched the earlier video on basic price earnings ratios. If that was a bit fast and you've got any extra questions, do feel free to email me, editor at killick.com, and I'll do my best to answer them.